Welcome, everybody. It's Tuesday, October 14th, 2014. My book is out today. As I told you, I'm delaying the official announcement. I'm just telling you guys, because you are the elite here, letting you know about it. Real Descent, a libertarian sets fire to the index card of allowable opinion. I'll tell you a little bit more about that after my conversation with David Friedman. I'm delighted to welcome David back to the program. David Friedman is an economist, physicist, and libertarian theorist. He's currently a professor of law at Santa Clara University, where he's been since 2005. Before that, he taught at UC Irvine, Cornell, Tulane, UCLA, the University of Pennsylvania, Columbia University, and the University of Chicago. We're going to talk to him today about the brand new edition, the third edition, of his book, The Machinery of Freedom, Guide to a Radical Capitalism, that was originally released in 1973. David Friedman, thanks for being here today. Glad to be here. There are a great many topics in The Machinery of Freedom, and I just got done telling people that it's out now in a third edition as of July. This book came out originally in 1973, then it was in a second edition in the late 80s, and now this third edition. Of course, sometimes you have to update the statistics on some of the things that you say early on, but are there any major areas in which your views have changed substantially since 1973 that's reflected in this current edition? Yeah, I think it's neither a matter of updating statistics nor changed views. The third edition, I would guess maybe a quarter of the material in it is new, something like that, a third to a quarter. And it's really in two categories. The new part five is what I think of as deeper discussions of things that were in some sense in the original book. Uh, and the part six is sort of a variety of new materials. Uh, you know, it's sort of hard to summarize the whole thing. Uh, I don't think there's anything important where my idea, my views have changed, but there are certainly things I understand better than I understood them 40 years ago. Well, in here, a reader is likely to encounter, if not absolutely everything that he's likely to encounter in a debate, then certainly an awful lot of topics are covered here. And I think, by and large, quite convincingly, one topic that comes up quite a bit or that I get requests to do programs on is one in which it seems to be taken for granted by practically everybody that the state is obviously the most efficient actor in solving, and that's the issue of pollution. How do you come up with, I mean, you have talked a little bit about that in this book, I think in chapter 26. How do you answer this, this issue that pollution would be hard to deal with as a strict private property matter, so we therefore have to have the traditional regulatory structure of the modern state in order to deal with it? Is there a, another option? I think there are some problems which are not going to be solved adequately in a uh, entirely free market society, but they're mostly problems that aren't solved adequately under other institutions either. Uh, that I actually have a chapter on the general issue of what economists call market failure, which is a somewhat misleading term because it isn't really about markets. But market failure describes situations where individually rational action doesn't lead to group rational action. So that if you think about, say, uh, air pollution in London in the late 19th century, uh, if I choose to burn coal in my fireplace, that keeps my house warm. It makes the London fog a little bit better, but the effect of my coal on me is so tiny that it doesn't pay me to pay attention to it. But we might be all, all be better off if we did something else because my coal affects you and your coal affects me and so forth. And that's an example of the general case where each of us is making the right decision for himself but the wrong decision for us. And the problem with market failure as an argument against laissez-faire is that the situations that lead to market failure, although they sometimes exist on the market, the ordinary private market are much more common on the political market because market failure ultimately comes from my taking actions where a large part of the cost or benefit goes to other people. That occasionally exists on, on the free market, as in the example of air pollution, but it's the normal situation on the political market where any decision that a voter or a legislator or a judge makes 
he is very unlikely to be the person bearing the cost of that decision. Uh, so in that sense, I think it's not, it's not that you can say the market will ideally solve the problem of air pollution. It won't. You can solve some of that problem uh, by things like the law, the common law of nuisance, which deals with costs that one neighbor imposes on another. But if you're thinking about the hard versions, where my cost is spread over hundreds of millions of people, uh, I don't think there's going to be a practical way of using a private legal system to deal with that. But then I don't think that the governments do a very good job either. And the cost of having governments deal with such problems is that they then uh, produce undesirable results uh, in a variety of, of, of other ways. That, that uh, as I say, that the general problem of my I'm not bearing the cost of my actions, so I do the wrong thing is very much more common on the political market than on the private market. Now, you're a physicist, so you have had scientific colleagues over the years, and I would think it would be a pretty hard sell to say to them that the funding of science ought to be left up to voluntary decision-making and ought to be divorced entirely from coercion. I would assume that scientists, like, well, frankly, any other professional group, are convinced that in the absence of the state, the carrying on the work of their profession would be difficult to impossible, and it's highly unlikely that the money that would be forthcoming in the absence of state involvement would be adequate to the purpose. How can expect, you take that on? I expect most people uh, are in favor of subsidies for whatever they do. Uh, there is actually an academic by the name of Terence Keeley, who has written, a, he's British, who is a scientist, not a physicist, I don't remember what his field is, I think to be bio something, uh, who has written a book arguing that on the evidence, state funding doesn't seem to be associated with scientific progress, that uh, he's got, as I remember, a number of cases where you have some field which was more or less unfunded for a long time and then suddenly became popular and the government put money into it, and his claim, at least, is you don't see an increased rate of, rate of progress. And if you think of sort of major scientific breakthroughs over the last few hundred years, uh, quite a lot of them, Darwin was not in any sense uh, state-funded. He was theoretically a clergyman. Uh, Ricardo wasn't to take, or, or Smith to take a, my two favorite early economists. Uh, geology was, the, the fundamental breakthroughs in geology, which is my wife's field, were made by a mining engineer and a gentleman farmer uh, who saw the the essential facts that geology was later later built on. Uh, a lot of scientific research, of course, is privately profitable, done by, by firms. Uh, part of Keeley's argument is that even research that isn't immediately applied, it pays uh, firms to have some employees involved in that because if you're part of the of, as it were, the community of, of scholars working in some field, they talk to each other, and it is useful for a firm to know not just what they can build today, but what scientific changes are likely to come that may matter to them in five years or ten years or twenty years twenty years from now. So he at least argues that there are mechanisms, though imperfect mechanisms, for doing that. And in a way, it's somewhat analogous to the open source movement in software, which is is a, is a situation where you have people who are, in a sense, producing general knowledge that is improving things like Linux, uh, and yet there are sufficient indirect ways of making it in the private interest of people to do it. So again, I don't, I don't think that you would get in a stateless or free market society the optimal level of, of scientific research, uh, that is the level that a perfectly wise, benevolent dictator would choose, but we don't have any perfectly wise, benevolent dictators out there. Uh, and I think you might well do better uh, than than the, the government does. One thing that encourages me in that view is my own experience. I got a doctorate in theoretical physics from Chicago, spent two years at Columbia as a postdoc, and then switched fields to economics. And looking back at it, my impression is that at the time I became a physicist, everybody knew that that was the important thing which really smart people were supposed to do. As far as I can tell, theoretical physics has produced very little in the last 40 years of actual use to people. We know more about certain questions than we did, but the important developments, uh, things like uh, 
computer chips and such have really come out of the application of physics that was already known back when I was a graduate student. Uh, so one way of looking at it is that the result of government funding was to divert a whole lot of very talented people into all working on the same problems rather than having those people out doing other and arguably more productive things. That Keeley book that you mentioned, The Economic Laws of Scientific Research, I yes. I just love this book. I, I, I read it cover to cover. I found it completely absorbing. I could not believe how systematically he overturned the conventional wisdom just page after page. Mm. It's not easy to get these days, but, well, these days you can find used copies, I suppose, but I, I would definitely direct people in that direction. Now, I've been getting emails from people linking me to news stories about what's been going on in Germany. Apparently, now I didn't click on these because these days I'm so busy, I don't click on things that I know are going to enrage me. And it had to do with a decision in Germany that I, I guess involves making college tuition free, in quotation marks. Now that just seems to the American progressive to be so obviously the path that Americans should follow, that to come back with, well, you know, that money has to come from somewhere, and so it really is just a wash after all, just doesn't seem likely to to make any headway with people like that. What can we say in opposition well, the to obvious, policy? The obvious thing to say is that subsidizing higher schooling uh, is a way of subsidizing the abler and richer people at the cost of the mass of the population. That if you think, I mean, the issue a long time ago in the U.S. where we had heavily subsidized state universities, and if you looked at it in the U.S. case, the people who went to that those state universities were roughly speaking from the top quarter of the income distribution, that there were occasionally talented poor people who ended up going to college, that most of the people who went to college were, you know, the children of doctors and lawyers and professors and, you know, other, not rich, but, you know, relatively successful people. And among the ones who went to college, insofar as they weren't selected by their parents' status and income, they were selected by their own ability. And on the whole, smart people are likely to make more money than stupid people. So it was a massive program of subsidizing uh, of the opposite of taking from the rich and giving to the poor, of taking from the people who couldn't, uh, who didn't have the ability or the time or whatever to go to college in order to subsidize those who did. Now, beyond that, my impression, and I think it's shared by a fair number of people who have taught at the university level, is that quite a large fraction of the people who are in college don't belong there, that they aren't actually learning anything very useful, that it's, it's four years uh, to socialize with other people your own age and have parties, and unfortunately one of the costs of having that four years uh, of socializing is you've got to take some classes and maybe even pass some exams, but that's really not what you're there for, that's the cost, that when my daughter went to Oberlin, one of the things that struck her was that when a class was canceled, the other students were happy. And that, I think, suggests what they're there for and what they aren't there for. So uh, I would have said that on the whole, uh, both the U.S. and probably Germany would be better off if there were fewer people going to college, uh, not more. Well, you're preaching to the choir on that, on that on, with, with that answer. On, on the, I want to move into the some of the new material that you have, because the last time we were on, you were saying that you'd been thinking further on the really difficult issue of defense, and that you were going to elaborate on this a bit in the third edition of your book. Before we get into the full-blown defense question, let me pose for you a hypothetical. This is the sort of argument that's made by conservatives against libertarians, and they'll use the example of Islam, but it's not necessary for us to get into the, the weeds of the subject of Islam. They'll say, let's just imagine there's some group some members of which want to come into your country and they let, let's imagine that they they state that their intent is to do all kinds of terrible things like they're coming here and they're going to try to hurt people and they would say that a libertarian can't do anything about that the libertarian has to say it would be bigotry to keep people out of the country who want to hurt you now let's suppose there is some group that does want to do this what could a libertarian society do? Does it have to wait until an attack is carried out and then after the fact clean up the mess? I would have said that generally saying you want to do bad things is not usually considered a crime in either a libertarian or an ordinary uh, system. So if, people, if, if, if the people who want to do bad things are helpful enough to tell you they want to do them, then you presumably watch them. And, you know, at the point, you, maybe you... Uh, 
bribe some of them to uh, inform on the rest. And uh, if, you, if you're lucky, you catch them at the point before the bombs go off. And if not, you punish them afterwards. Uh, that's, after all, the same situation as ordinary crime, that, that we don't usually propose that the way we deal with murder is to figure out in advance who are the people who are likely to be murderers and, and lock them up. And if we were going to do that, I think we would end up with a lot of innocent people uh, in prison. That, that, you know, so many of these arguments take it for granted that the decisions are being made correctly by, you know, wise and benevolent people, and that's not who usually end up making uh, immigration decisions. You, you know, there have been some fairly prominent cases uh, at this point where the... Uh, I guess the TSA, or I'm not sure who, but various government agencies have refused to let somebody fly or done various other things, and then when it finally is traced down, it turns out that they've got no good reason at all. They made a mistake and then spent a couple of years trying to hide the mistake and causing further problems for the people involved. So uh, <clears throat> I think it's a great mistake to try to make the utopian argument, to try to say that the society libertarians want would have no problems because there aren't any societies with no problems. And the right argument usually is to say, yes, it will have problems, but we here is why we expect them to be less than the problems with the alternatives. Well, I suppose that's the also the type of argument that would be made on the more general subject of defense. Now, there are the two fundamental issues that even, let's say, small government libertarians would have, as you well know, would be law and defense. Uh, court system and defense. Now, you've you've covered law at great length in this book and different essays, talking about other legal systems. A, a lot, lot of interesting things to be said about that. But let's hone in on the defense question because it's, I think that yeah. Go ahead. My, my chapter in the in the original machinery, I refer to that as the hard problem, and the reason it's a hard problem from an economist standpoint is that it's a extreme example of what we call a public good. That right. if I spend on an anti-missile system to stop missiles. They stop missiles that are aimed at you as well as at me. And if I uh, prevent an invasion, that keeps that protects everybody behind the, the front line, not just me. So the problem is how you get people uh, in a non-governmental system to somehow uh, produce this public good. And we know that public goods do get produced privately. Uh, quite a lot of them do. Uh, I mentioned open source software uh, as as one example, but there are, are lots of other examples in which people find imperfect ways of doing it. I guess my favorite example uh, is the one you're engaged in. Actually, I'm not sure is, is this over the air as well as online. It's it's a podcast, so it is uh -huh. pretty much exclusively online. Yeah, I'd have to let, let me let me. Uh, I'm I'm a little out of date on this one, so let me take the example of radio broadcast. Okay, because a radio broadcast. Uh, is a very pure uh, public good that if you broadcast a radio program, anybody within range can hear it. The person broadcasting it can't, as with ordinary private goods, say to the customers, if you don't pay, you don't get it. So the obvious implication is that unless government paid for it, there'd be no radio broadcast and no television. But that doesn't seem to be the case. And the reason in that case is some unknown genius in the past thought up the idea of producing not one public good but two, one of them being a radio broadcast which has a positive cost of production and a positive value to the customer, and the other being an advertisement which has a negative cost of production because the companies will pay you to put it on, and often a negative value to the listener, and then tie the two tightly together and give away the package. And that's one example of an ingenious way of somebody figuring out how to produce a public good. And I spend a chapter in the new edition I had some discussion in the first edition, but I've got a lot more in the new edition, on discussing possible ways in which you could get people to produce national defense, even though it's a, it's a public good. Uh, so I don't know how much of that you want me to go into, but, but the basic, there is a basic problem there. And if the problem is bad enough, maybe you can't afford to abolish government yet. That was my, the point I made back in, 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 the, in, in the first edition, that if you have a society with very aggressive, uh, you know, dangerous enemies all around it. Uh, maybe you won't be able, by voluntary methods, to get enough of a defense to defend you. But that isn't the situation in the U.S. It hasn't been for a very long time. But I did some calculations at the time of the first Iraq War, adding up the GNP of the two sides. And the odds of the first Iraq War measured by economic resources were roughly 100 to 1. That's not a war. 
not a it's not someplace where you're actually under danger. And I think if you look at the situation at present, uh, the U.S. is mainly involved in conflict with Muslims because the U.S. chooses to be involved in conflict with Muslims because uh, we have intervened, I think, foolishly uh, in the Middle East over a long a long period of time. Uh, so, so I don't think uh, I don't think the U.S. is actually in that sort of situation or likely to be any time in the near future. Now, when I wrote Machinery of Freedom, uh, the Soviet Union was still a going concern. And at that point, I was a good deal less sure than I am now that the U.S. could manage without a, a government providing defense because it took substantial resources. But at this point, I don't think either Mexico or Canada is likely to invade us. Well, leaving aside these two really difficult questions of of law and of defense. I don't think law is a really difficult question. Oh, okay. I think law I'd, is an I'd like to question. I'd like to hear that is, objection. Law is a private good, not a public good. That is to say, mechanisms for enforcing rights uh, or institutions for enforcing rights can easily enough say to the customer, if you're not our customer, we won't protect your rights. So, so I think law is a very interesting question. But one of the points that I make in the new edition, because I didn't know it when I wrote the first edition, is that private decentralized law enforcement mechanisms are not a new idea. That in fact, I believe it's the case that many and perhaps most existing legal systems evolved out of legal systems in which law enforcement was private and decentralized. And I have a discussion of how such systems worked and a number of examples of systems of that sort. Now, whether that'll work in a modern society, one doesn't know, but I at least tried to sketch out in the first edition ways in which you could, in a modern society, have law and law enforcement that didn't depend on government. And what my conclusion much later was that what I was doing was really the complicated modern version of something simple versions of which had existed many times in the past. But it's sort of like when you're writing an economics textbook, one approach is to start out with Robinson Crusoe on his island and say, what does he do? And then you add Friday and you add a few more people and it gradually gets more complicated. And there's a certain sense in which what I was doing in the first edition was reinventing the wheel, was sketching out what a complicated modern society's version would be of the kind of legal system that in fact has existed at various times in the past in much more primitive societies. Well, that's what I mean when I say that it's a hard question. I don't mean that we haven't got a good argument for it. I mean it requires people to think in ways that they're not, well, inclined to think. It's one thing to say, I think if we got rid of rent control, the world would not end. I think people can look around at other cities that don't have rent control and say, well, I guess you're right. I mean, I, I can see it with my own eyes. But to say to them, well, we have to think of how could our society employ ideas that we derive from societies from a long time ago or from different places yep. is is trickier to get them to think of and the classic example they give you is just the simple one of this guy stole my car and I want to take him to court and he refuses to show up yep. so what can we do to say how can we put them at ease on something like that what is the mechanism that would make that guy show up I spent uh, part three of the first edition trying to answer that question, so I'm not sure short answers are, are useful, but questions can be hard in two different senses. One of them is fundamentally hard, which I think national defense is, in the sense that, that however much you think about it, you can't be confident that your answer, you can't have good reasons to think your answer will work, and the other is hard only in the sense that because you can't point at obvious examples right. uh, as, in your, as, as in your case. But the basic system that I've sketched out in machinery is a system in which you have firms that sell their customers the service of rights protection, of, of, of rights enforcement, and also settling disputes. These firms realize that if there is a conflict between the customers of two firms, there's going to be a problem. Uh, when people start thinking about this, they say, well, obviously this will be a war, but wars are very expensive, and it have very uncertain outcomes. And it makes a lot more sense for each pair of rights uh, protection, rights enforcement agencies to agree in advance on a court that will settle their dispute and then say, all right, well, if the court says that our customer is guilty, we won't defend him. And if the court says that our customer isn't guilty, you agree not to try to make him you know, pay you damages for your damaged car or whatever it is. Uh, so I that would be a very, very short description of, of, of how such a system would work. And in the new edition, I discuss in some detail 
a particular problem which had not occurred to me when I wrote the first edition and which was pointed out by James Buchanan in his review of Machinery of Freedom, which was, I like to say that was the only good review the book got because it was the only review that made me think, which is, from my standpoint, the real function of the, of the review. And he pointed out a problem in my argument, and I spend a chapter or so in the new edition trying to respond to that, uh, to that problem. Uh, but, uh, but the basic argument is, is, is very simple, namely that, that you do ultimately have the threat of force uh, backing you up when people you know, injure you and refuse to compensate you, uh, but that you can organize that threat of force in such a way that rather than every conflict leading to a fight, the normal result of a conflict is a court case in a private court that the agencies that the two people involved or customers have agreed on, and then the agencies act as, as middlemen to, to, uh, settle, to settle the case. And, and that's a fancy version of a system that's existed in a lot of societies in which what basically enforces rights is that if you wrong me, I threaten to harm you unless you compensate me. And when those systems work, it's because there is some mechanism such that right makes might. Some mechanism such that my threat against you is believable if you really have wronged me and is not believable if you haven't, so that it's rights enforcement rather than extortion. And I discuss in more detail in the third edition, because I now know more about that, uh, how some historical societies provided, provided that mechanism. Uh, not, uh, not through a government that was enforcing rights, but through some way in which all of the interested third parties could figure out who was the good guy and who was the bad guy in act accordance. Well, the book we've been talking about is the third edition of The Machinery of Freedom, Guide to a Radical Capitalism. David, your website is daviddfriedman.com. Can people get the book through there and through the usual outlets? They, through that, they can read for free the second edition as a, as, as a PDF. But if they want to read the third edition, it's currently a Kindle on Amazon. So I, I think I've got a link to it on my website. I'm pretty sure I do. But you can just go straight to Amazon and look for Machinery or Freedom in their Kindles, uh, and it's there, and it doesn't cost very much. It's like write books mainly to spread ideas, not mainly to, to make money. But I like to say that when you're young, you're afraid people will steal your ideas, and when you're old, you're afraid they won't. I like that. I like that. It's a very good uh, note to end on. We'll uh, try and direct people over to your site and, of course, to the book. Thanks so much for your time again today, David. We all appreciate it. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. All right, everybody. I told you at the beginning that today is the release date for my new book. I have not released a book in nearly four years, and I'm probably going to start the full court press on this one tomorrow. I can do this at my leisure because it's self-published. This is something I have never done before. I've always gone through traditional publishers, but just for the heck of it, I thought, ah, why not? Let's see how this works. I'm very pleased so far. By tomorrow, I'll have a nice landing page with all the different formats available and all kinds of fun goodies on it, and I'll give you the URL for that on the program tomorrow. But for now, you can check out Real Descent at, uh, of course, on Amazon in the Kindle edition and in the paperback version. The Kindle edition is available also if you are a supporting listener of the show at supportinglisteners.com. you got to log in, and you can get your copy of the Kindle edition that way as a thank you, thank you, thank you for making this program possible. So supportinglisteners.com is where you want to go for that. And I know some of you guys like audiobooks. I know because you're listening to an audio podcast right now. And for this book, I did the audio myself. I recorded it myself. I did the reading. I'm not always happy with the people they choose to read my books, not because I'm a control freak, which, by the way, I am, but in this case, that's not the explanation. I find that they use the dullest voices. I, I don't understand what the thinking behind that is. So I thought, well, you know what, doggone it, I'm publishing this book myself. I'm going to read it myself. Just go to TomWoodsAudio.com. You'll get a, th a free 30-day trial at Audible, plus you'll get Real Descent for free. So TomWoodsAudio.com is where to go for the free audiobook edition. So please help me spread the word about this book. I'm entirely on my own. I don't have a big marketing department from a publisher this time. It's just me. Just me against the world. Well, you know what? It's you guys plus me against the world. 
and I really appreciate that. I, I don't know. I guess, I guess against the world is <laughs> maybe the best way I should put it. But you understand what I'm saying. I really could use the help, and I would certainly appreciate you letting people know about it. As I say, tomorrow I got this fancy schmancy landing page with a little video and the links and some background and a free excerpt and all kinds of fun stuff. Details on that tomorrow. We'll see you then. Thanks for listening, everybody. The Tom Woods Show.